And a good security system should not make you do any compromise, right? You, you don't really have to choose between privacy and physical security. Uh, there's really a good way to make them work together. Because most of the data that we use, that we transmit and, and store in security systems is very sensitive. So we need to handle that with care and we need to protect the confidentiality. Um, we need to have full visibility uh, on what is stored in there, who can access it, how it's protected. But also if we can protect the identity of people as much as possible, uh, this is going to be very helpful. So we can see that as kind of the fourth pillar of cybersecurity here, data or privacy protection. So we divided the uh, in four main topics. Uh, first one is just a reminder of you need to have full control over who sees what, right? So uh, authentication, just uh, again here, is probably one of the most important layers to ensure data privacy. We, we've covered these concepts. Uh, this is, again, just to quickly uh, say that you need to restrict the scope of activity within the system. Only give access rights to groups or individuals for certain resources, data, or applications, and then further define what they can do. Another very important method here is dynamic video anonymization, or blurring, or masking, or pixelization, right? So this is to maintain the privacy of people on cameras, uh, so operators only see what they need to see. So this, this is for live recorded video indoors and outdoors. It is fully customizable uh, with our privacy protection module. And then when you share evidence, you also need to protect privacy, right? Because as I mentioned, USB or DVD, this is no longer acceptable to share critical evidence. Um, it is even a clear requirement by many regulations. You need to do this on a secure cloud-based portal. So we have solutions to do that and in addition to redact all of the faces of irrelevant people on that video, right? The bystanders, witnesses, other people walking around. And of course, everything needs to be protected. All the information needs to be encrypted. And then we have personal data and identity management. This is a very important component. Uh, identity is the new parameter and security. Since perimeter defense is no longer valid, uh, we need to validate the identity of every person, every machine, and use that as a foundation for all the interactions on the network. So centralizing the identity makes it much easier to protect, meaning having a single identity for all of the systems they will access, the video system, access control, license plate recognition, or anything that's connected to your ecosystem. Um, and also if they request uh, to be forgotten, right? Someone comes in and asks for their information to be deleted. Maybe it's a visitor of your company or an employee that's that's gone. Then it's much easier to remove that personal information quickly if it's properly centralized. So having better visibility on the identity and more control, it's really becoming an essential in a security system. And very quickly here, there's two types of privacy masking for video surveillance. Uh, one is static and the other one is dynamic masking. Uh, the, the first one is really comparable to motion detection. You just block certain areas in the video field, field. And the second one is that you're masking all the relevant objects in the video. There's only a, a mask in the image where, where and when there needs to be a mask, right? So. You can record video in public or more sensitive areas, for example, on campus or hospital rooms, uh, and incidents can still be recognized. So here we saw that an incident happened. We can remove the privacy protection with the right credentials, right? So only the right people have access to the original unblurred video. So in general, dynamic masking will fit a much wider range of applications. And then just a few pointers regarding GDPR, which is the main regulation in Europe. This is very important for our customers to understand and make sense of this regulation, which can be very complex if you look at just uh, all the different articles out there. When it comes to 
concrete steps you need to do uh, according to GDPR. First, it may be required to have a data protection officer. Um, so it's kind of, uh, they will keep track of everything that's happening. They will, um, they will make sure that uh, you implement the right things and that you have full visibility on your assets and the data. And then you need to properly map your data processing operations, right? So identify the key elements and describe the flow of the information that you have in your system. And then you, you need to identify all the actions and also assign priorities on how you're going to comply with the regulation and maybe other more specific uh, in-country privacy laws. And then a DPIA, the Data Protection Impact Assessment. This is really for higher risk activities that you should uh, prioritize that, right? So you need to first assess the risks of all of your security activities and then evaluate the impact if there was a breach. And from there, you need to implement the right procedures, uh, the internal policies when if there's a breach and if there's a request for information. So of course, uh, protecting data and anonymizing information will be part of that uh, number five. And finally, you need to create and maintain documentation of every single step. So everything you're doing, in the context of GDPR, in the context of complying, uh, this needs to be clearly documented. 